Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Wilson from um, the Irving Institute at Dartmouth College and really excited to be here today to welcome you to our energy stimulus, investing in the power grid of the future. This is a fabulous time for this conversation. And today we have a series of experts that make everybody jealous. Um, this is co-sponsored with Dartmouth's Department of Government and the, the Rocky Center, the Rubber Center for Energy, the Thayer School and the Sustainability Group at Dartmouth as well. So there's, we've all come together to really be part of this conversation and thinking about our energy future. And um, today our experts are going to be speaking for six minutes each and then we're leaving time for a question and answer at the end. If you would like to submit your questions um, in, the question, in the chat in the question box, Stephanie will then pass them to me and we'll have a conversation at the end. We've asked our policy experts to go first, so Sue Tierney will be followed by Dan Riker. And then our, our colleagues from the renewable energy industry, um, Abby Hopper, President and CEO of the Solar Energy Industries Association, and Tom Kiernan from the American Wind Energy Association, followed finally by Jeff Daigle from Pacific Northwest National Labs to talk about cybersecurity. So they each have six minutes. And with that, Sue, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And it's nice to uh, see these uh, wonderful panelists uh, up there with me, and it's great to be here. In May of this year, uh, I wrote an op-ed for Utility Dive, and I called it Powering Through and Beyond the Crisis. And it was really talking about the role of electricity in, uh, in helping people stay connected and, and healthy during this uh, pandemic. Today, I want to talk about powering out of the pandemic and powering out of the economic pits that it has brought about around the country. So let me set the stage for our discussion. Uh, first, it's really great that any stimulus packages that have already been enacted have focused on relief. Uh, Americans really have been suffering and that's been the, the highest priority and deservedly so. But for many reasons, it will also be historic when the nation begins to focus on economic recovery and not just relief. Uh, the House signaled that the time to do that is now. Two weeks ago, the House passed the Moving Forward Act, which included uh, $1.5 trillion aimed at infrastructure spending and incentives, including for renewables and energy efficiency and for transportation, among other things. When bipartisan consensus emerges on a uh, infrastructure bill, and I know we're not there yet, I hope it includes investment in the power grid for the future, and in particular, the wires portion. You're going to hear from Dan, Abby, Tom, and Jeff about some specific issues related to investments in the grid, uh, but I would like to focus on the wires for a particular reason. It's really well understood in the electric industry that we have a fundamental chicken and egg problem associated with developing big renewables at scale. You can't develop power supply in a very big way in regions with really high quality re renewables, such as the Plain States, areas offshore of the Northeast States, the Sun Belt, and so forth, until the developers of those big projects know that they can deliver their power to areas where people live. And in many regions, you can't develop transmission capacity until you know you'll be connecting those regions with electricity consumers. So if you want to use stimulus dollars to get renewables onto the system, you actually need to beef up the grid. Doing that means using stimulus investment to help with long distance transmission projects for sure. And there's a lot of important project and investment that could occur to support a very large build out of the uh, renewables uh, profile, renewable resources across the country. But it also means invest in investments in the local grid of the future. With stimulus dollars leveraging investment and in jobs relating to solar panels on homes and buildings and electric vehicle charging stations, the local distribution system needs to modernize to support those projects and the changes that occur on the grid as a result of them. So how might stimulus dollars support these enabling infrastructure investments? In several ways, planning grants for transmission expansion, planning support for people who are interested in uh, participating in those exercises uh, for regional plans, tax credits, ta uh, cash grants to utilities to invest in advanced metering, other hardware on the existing grid, building up capacity 
on existing facilities, cyber protections, system controls to better manage flows on the grids. You could also use stimulus dollars to provide carrots to states to update their siting laws to take it into account the fact that they rely on interconnected regions increasingly to have a reliable and economic supply, especially in a grid that is decarbonizing. Uh, you could use it for training po programs for people who work on various aspects of the grid. And you could even support broadband in rural areas because people in those regions need to be able to participate in a more interactive grid in order to better manage their electricity bills. So my bottom line is this, just as we have depended upon the grid to help us get through these trying times, the grid can also be part of the solution as we build up a more resilient economy and put Americans back to work, we can do that in a way that positions us better for the future. Thank you very much. Dan, you're up. And Dan, you are on mute. Now I have fixed my infrastructure problem. So I'm pleased to go and thank you, Sue. Thank you, Elizabeth. Greetings, fellow panelists and greetings all. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to talk today. And so I was a member of both the Clinton and Obama administrations and, the, and on the um, transition teams for both. And on the Obama transition team, we assembled the first cut of the 2009 clean energy stimulus package. And that was in the depths of the last recession. Um, reflecting that experience, I wrote a piece in March called Turning the Virus into a Virtue for the Planet. I stressed that in 2009, we made the single largest investment, $90 billion, that we've ever made as a nation in clean energy. And we had some very notable results. One million low-income homes weatherized, the first five solar projects bigger than 100 megawatts, Tesla's purchase of a shutdown auto assembly plant in Silicon Valley, and the world's largest carbon capture project at a coal plant. I very strongly believe we can and must do this again, but I have to quickly note that the need and the challenge are a lot higher because of course we now have not only a serious recession, but also a global pandemic and a climate problem far worse than a decade ago. We also have a, a really important collision of timeframes where actions required. In a global pandemic, we measure response in hours and days, today's infection rate versus yesterday's. In an economic recession, we measure response in weeks and months, the employment rate in June versus July. And in a climate crisis, we measure response in years and decades, 100% zero net carbon emissions by 2050. These conflicting timeframes make for difficult policy decisions. How do you get the US House or the US Senate to take up a federal clean energy standard set in decades when the key is getting ventilators tomorrow or extending unemployment insurance next month. I wrote a piece in April called Earth Day at 50, Galloping Global Pandemic and Lumbering Climate Crisis. I said the pandemic is a wake up call for a planet that increasingly will have to fight multiple global emergencies. In doing so, we have to strike a smart balance between short term and long term actions. Of course, the current global climate I'm sorry, of course, current global attention must be focused on the rampaging virus, but we just can't afford to stop making progress on climate. And the November conference of the 175 parties to the Paris Agreement has already been canceled due to COVID-19, but why not instead move it online like many other key government and private sector groups have done in the past months. So three pieces of good news. First, we know a great deal about how to fight these worldwide crises. Our best and brightest in global health are developing, racing to develop effective vaccines, rapid testing, and new treatments. And we're making serious progress, as all of you know, in the development and deployment of low carbon and lower cost energy technologies, wind, solar, efficiency, carbon capture, advanced nuclear plug-in vehicles, and the like. A more climate friendly planet with more livable cities and healthier ecosystems will be in a stronger position actually to fight public health emergencies. And a better organized and funded public health system will be more equipped to address the next hurricane or flood that have been accelerated by climate change. Second, with an economy in free fall, we need to put people back to work as soon as it is safe. The US clean energy industry in companies both large and small is a smart place to focus. It has obviously taken a recent hit, as you'll hear, 
But with the rising climate imperative and the falling cost of clean energy technologies, this is a critical 21st century industry. China has already made that bet, and we should as well, if only to strengthen US competitiveness. Third, the tools are in the toolbox on Capitol Hill and at the White House for a clean energy stimulus. We can do part of it through a long awaited infrastructure package, as Sue explained, linking a pending transportation infrastructure bill with a pending water infrastructure bill and making sure both have serious green elements from massive scale up of electric vehicle infrastructure to a major push for modernizing our hydropower and pump storage facilities. We can add in smart tax policy from extending key renewable energy credits to a new storage tax credit to opening up attractive federally authorized financing vehicles like master limited partnerships that are today the exclusive province of traditional energy industries. And we can get money off the sidelines, for example, the more than $40 billion for innovative clean energy projects that are sitting unused at the energy department. This kind of money can leverage vastly greater amounts of private capital that are essential to addressing climate change with global spending requirements measured at more than two trillion, that's trillion with a T annually, to stay within two degrees centigrade and current spending at only about a third of that. A pending bipartisan idea of Federal Clean Energy Deployment Administration would also be a great way to institutionalize this public leveraging of vastly greater private investment. An updated version of this was introduced just last week by three members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. These approaches, particularly taken together, will help us avoid the short-term shovel-ready project focus that admittedly constrained the 2009 stimulus package. And finally, finally, we have the ultimate policy tool at our disposal, and that is called the November elections, where we as citizens get to decide on who will lead us in the face of these multiple global emergencies and critically put us in a position to take the single most important step on U.S. clean energy and that is finally enacting comprehensive federal climate legislation. So whatever your politics, get involved and vote. Thank you very much. And over to Abby. Great, thank you. Um, Dan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great, thank you. That's my, my issue is the speakers sometimes work and sometimes don't. <laughs> So good afternoon, um, or good, I always have to say good morning for those of you on the West Coast. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and your team for um, convening us. Oh, wait, hold on, I've started my timer. And thank you um, to my co-panelists. It's nice to virtually see you. I see, I get to see Tom Kiernan more now than ever, though, <laughs> just, just on the screen. <laughs> we're, we're kind of a, a, a frequently requested duo. Uh, which is great. It's, we're obviously both Dartmouth alum, and so it's, it feels extra special to be back here talking with you about this. Um, I want to talk, a, I, I, so yes to everything that Sue and um, Dan said, and I'm guessing yes to what Tom and Jeff are going to say, although I don't know exactly. Um, so I just want to chat a little bit about the solar industry, um, sort of what some of the unique pieces are um, that would be helpful to us as we think about stimulus and how we grow the solar um, piece of that. But I want to start by really framing how we think about it. And I think I share this with a lot of folks, Tom and I, and two of our other colleagues. We also wrote something. <laughs> We're often very busy during quarantine. We wrote something recently about a shared vision uh, for renewable energy. And you know, we are the, the represent companies. And so as we've talked with our companies, we think we can go to get to more than 50% renewable in the next decade with the technology we have, many of the tools we already have. We can get to much more deployment with some additional policy levers, and that, that's a lot of what we're talking about. But I share that because it's really, we, I look at this and I think my industry looks at this holistically. We are, we, I, you know, solar is in the name of my organization, but I am deeply invested in a clean energy revolution and a transformation of, of our markets. And so that's what I think about. How do we get that transformation um, clearly, as Sue said, energy is such a critical part of our economy and our economic growth and our, and our health uh, that we need to really reimagine how we utilize it. So absolutely agree with the tax policy and the carbon policy um, and a holistic policy. As I think about the transmission, right, how do, you, how do you get those nice little electrons to the people that need them? That is critically important and I think stimulus offers a really great opportunity. 
Um, one of the things I've really noticed during this crisis is how important our own homes are. I don't know about you, I've been in mine for months now, um, but the, the ability to generate our own electricity and have control over our own power source. And so I think we will see more, even greater adoption of distributed resources as we think about the electrification of our vehicle fleet and how those technologies interact in a home and then on the grid. And then God bless, Jeff's gonna tell us how to keep it all safe. Um, you know, that is I think an area where we can really invest. And then lastly, I just, I feel uh, compelled to speak a little bit about what I see and I, I am not unique. These are not my words, but sort of the trifecta of crisis we're facing, the climate crisis, which is absolutely urgent, the health crisis and the racial justice crisis. Um, this is there incredibly intertwined. I was with a reporter this morning talking about you know, folks that are more vulnerable to the virus are folks that already have respiratory disease, which are folks that live near fossil fuel generators, which are usually uh, communities of color. And so these things, we can't divorce one from the other, and we really need to think about that holistically. So um, I would say that last piece about workforce development, um, and, you know, I, I really would push us to not just think about how do we create jobs in the clean energy economy, but how do we create wealth? wealth and business opportunity and entrepreneurship for people who don't usually have those opportunities, right? So where are the, what are the federal programs that can help do that? We think a lot about that um, in our industry and we think a lot about sort of the mentoring programs and supplier diversity and um, sort of making sure that there's mentorships and training. But that I think is a challenge that we should all embrace. Uh, and really look to uh, this opportunity. You know, we do have a unique opportunity here to help shape this workforce of the future. I know just on the solar front, um, as we think about getting to those big goals, not even the big goals that, um, that our vice, the vice president, the, the former vice president has, uh, is laying out, I think almost simultaneously as us, but just Tom and I, uh, our vision, um, we would go from about 250,000, well, 250,000 pre-corona, we lost 72,000 jobs already, but over 600,000 jobs um, in the next nine years. And so who are those employees? Where do they come from? How are they empowered? What kind of protections do they have? What kind of you know, ownership opportunities and wealth creation opportunities do they have? And so uh, I am excited to do that work. I'm excited to think totally outside of the box about how we might do that work together. Um, but I think, you know, convening people like this who, who see the big policy pieces, understand the technical side, but also have a deep commitment um, to the justice is really critical. So that's, uh, that is my uh, word from Washington, D.C. And I will now hand it over to my friend and colleague across the river in the great state, the Commonwealth of Virginia. All righty, thank you very much, Abby. Yes, uh, we are, I don't know, Mutt and Jeff or what we are, but often doing speaking engagements together. And it's great to, to do this with Abby. And I also wanna give a shout out, Elizabeth and the Irving Institute. Thank you along with the other partners uh, for pulling this together. I do think uh, I'm a Dartmouth 81 and uh, it was those four years that I was there um, that very much shaped my trajectory on environment and clean energy. And so I applaud folks on this conference call or on the Zoom thinking about how they want to pursue their passions. Um, so let me share a few thoughts um, up front. As Abby mentioned, Vice President Biden is releasing as we speak his plan going forward. Um, it is... Uh, even more ambitious than the vision that Abby and I did put out a, a number of weeks ago, wind, solar, hydro, and storage, calling for 50% renewables by 2030. Um, but I think with the appropriate comprehensive policy support, we can exceed the vision that we laid out there. But I emphasize this point on comprehensive, and I think Sue spoke to this and Dan did as well, there's, I think, a tendency people to talk about, okay, what's the target? 50% by 2030, or the vice president saying 100% clean by 2035. Those are great targets and we need the targets. But the reality is to get those um, uh, wind plants up there, solar storage, et cetera, we do have to do a lot to modernize the grid. Sue mentioned, I'm sure Jeff's gonna talk about 
we have significant transmission barriers in this country. The grid is a 1950s grid. I think the Society of Civil Engineers gave our grid a D minus, I believe, or maybe it was a D plus, but either way, it was not a good grade. It's an outdated grid. We need to upgrade the grid, add transmission lines if we're gonna get clean energy, for example, wind energy from farms in Iowa to load in Chicago. We need new transmission. As Abby mentioned, we need markets that are fair. Wind and solar uh, energy producers have to compete in the energy markets. And right now, somewhat understandably, those markets are skewed towards incumbent providers that are your fossil generators. We need fair and level markets, and that's gonna require all kinds of regulatory updates and improvements. We also, because of COVID, are having a challenge financing our wind and solar projects. And so we are calling on Congress to come up with new ways of providing our previously given tax credits, but through a thing called direct pay instead of doing tax equity. Um, we're looking for, uh, for example, for offshore wind of having some additional time to develop the project. So we're talking to Congress and to the administration uh, because COVID has slowed down the development of some of these projects, just giving us some additional time. We're also looking for some additional permitting efficiencies. It is not the simplest thing to cite, whether it's an offshore wind farm or an onshore wind farm, where we're trying to obviously work to make sure we're not in a, an important avian flyway or in sensitive habitat. And so we've got to be able to have efficient permitting decisions that say yes to permit it or no, this is not gonna work. Either way, we need a quick decision on those permitting, whether it's from the state or federal. We also need enhanced electrification, whether it's of transportation or buildings, et cetera, throughout the country, if we're going to meet the climate crisis. So my point, and others have mentioned it, we do need comprehensive solutions. So one of the reasons I so loved my time at Dartmouth was we did try to think interdisciplinarily, trying to think about what's the engineering, what's the political, what's the economic, what's the business dimensions. Similarly, as we're trying to address the climate crisis, as we're trying to design the right stimulus, whether it's now or in the next Congress, we do need multi-dimensional comprehensive approaches. The last point I, I do want to make is, uh, and here again, it was uh, made in advance and very well said by Abby, the crises that we are facing as a country and, and as a world, the, the global pandemic and its related public health crisis, the economic recessions that we're facing, the injustices that we're facing in the country, the work that we do on the clean energy economy can be helpful to part and parcel with addressing some of these other challenges. Uh, not that it's the totality of it, but we can advance a clean energy economy in a way that helps address some of the social injustices that draws communities of color into our workforce at a much greater rate than we have in the past. And I know the wind and I believe solar with Abby's leadership are very much up for this challenge as we address public health challenges clean energy clearly will help with that. As we're addressing recession challenges, clearly we're in a position to hire. So these are um, extraordinarily transformative times. I think the clean energy industry and movement is absolutely part of the solution. And we need, frankly, everybody's help, everybody's role and involvement in this movement. So with that, let me pass it off to Jeff to talk about the all important security dimensions of this movement. Jeff. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, my name is Jeff Dago. I'm an electrical engineer, uh, 31 years at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. That's one of the DOE labs uh, located out in Washington state. So it's like, like to tell my colleagues from the DC area, it's the other Washington. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm going to talk about cybersecurity, resilience, and cyber resilience. Uh, so first on cybersecurity, Dan previously mentioned that there was a, um, uh, back in 2009, we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, 
And as part of that, DOE had some stimulus money associated with smart grid investment grants and smart grid demonstration projects. And one of the things that we did back then is we recognized that a lot of the grants that we were awarding to utilities to help uh, spur investment in things like uh, smart grid technologies, uh, such as automated metering and, and other uh, advanced controls and sensing technologies and, and various things, um, may not have been covered under the existing cybersecurity requirements that apply to the bulk uh, energy system that we have in the U.S. Um, a lot of uh, our infrastructure is outside the jurisdiction of what the federal government regulates. Um, at the distribution level, it's mostly governed by state regulations. And there's kind of a patchwork of requirements that utilities follow uh, with respect to cybersecurity requirements. And one of the concerns was back then, uh, if we were incentivizing utilities to make a lot of investment in new and unproven technologies, might we be opening the door for uh, introducing new cybersecurity problems into the grid? And so uh, DOE, working closely with other agencies, came up with uh, cybersecurity requirements that the grant uh, recipients uh, must follow. And uh, including a cybersecurity plan and audits uh, from the DOE to make sure that those grants are being invested in technologies wisely and not introducing new vulnerabilities in the system. And I think that was um, met with a fair bit of success. And uh, one of the metrics is that we didn't see any uh, large-scale compromises of these of these systems. So I think uh, either we were good or, or lucky or maybe both, but uh, uh, that those technologies were deployed without uh, any big concerns. But I want to switch gears to resilience. Uh, the picture, in fact, behind me is, uh, is not just a random uh, clip that I, that I got. Uh, it's a picture I took of a substation uh, near New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. And events like Katrina and Superstorm Sandy that we had in 2012 and other events like that underscore how critically important our energy infrastructure is and why resilience is so important because quick recovery of our of our grid when there's a problem is very, very important. And events like that are very challenging to recover from quickly. And when we think about security, whether it be cybersecurity or physical security, other types of things that could go uh, wrong on the grid, we want to keep in mind that resilience is the uh, limiting the damage, but also bringing back uh, critical services quickly. And in 2017, there was a National Academies report on enhancing the resilience of the electrical grid that I think does a, a great job of laying out uh, uh, some of the issues and recommendations associated with enhancing resilience for our critical electricity system. And, uh, you know, one of the things, speaking of stimulus, one of the things that um, that report addressed is that while most uh, investment in our grid is paid for by ratepayers, there is some precedence for sharing uh, these investments with other sources of funding. So, for example, following the uh, Superstorm Sandy, uh, the state of New Jersey had some grants to uh, infrastructure to uh, relocate uh, critical facilities above uh, the FEMA floodplains, for example. And so it can be a blend of ratepayer investment and taxpayer investment to, to make these resilience-enhancing um, um, changes to the grid, recognizing that there's societal benefit as well as uh, benefit directly to the consumers of electricity. So um, uh, that report uh, went into a, a large number of recommendations, but one of the things that uh, it touched on is my third point I'd like to make today, and that's cyber resilience. Cyber resilience goes beyond cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is intended to put in place the mechanisms to keep the systems uh, uh, operating um, and functioning and try to keep the adversaries at bay through uh, uh, various uh, uh, countermeasures to preserve the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your critical systems. But cyber resilience takes it one step further and it recognizes that you may not necessarily uh, be able to perfect 100% secure systems, but what you need to do is have a mechanism in place to respond to events should they occur and bring your critical systems back. And so it's very similar to the approach that we take with grid resilience. It's important to keep the grid functioning, keep the lights on, keep the reliability high, but more importantly, it's, it's wise to be able to bring it back when there is an issue. 
And uh, it kind of reminds me in a way of General Eisenhower's quote. Uh, he says, uh, uh, in preparing for battle, uh, plans are priceless, but planning, or plans are useless, excuse me, but planning is indispensable. And that's what I think about with respect to security and resilience. It's important to have these plans in place, but the more important part is going through the process of doing that planning so we can be prepared and recover for unexpected events. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, send it back to Elizabeth to uh, moderate our Q&A. Thank you all so much. Um, one of the, the pieces that I loved about each of your perspectives, we've got to think about the big policy, the grid linking us all together, the specific mechanisms for financing, technologies in play and how they interact with our communities, our workforce issues, and then really how it all fits together and the, the need to have a, a secure system that works together. And we have some super questions that people have um, submitted and I will go to those right now. We have one from a, a DOE colleague. Hello to uh, Dan and Sue from Stephen Fried. Fried, Fried. If people could, even if people could agree on certain policy ideas, from investments in transmission to renewables, how can you reconcile the disconnected constituencies when policy is implemented? Federal policy, DOE and FERC versus states, 50 separate regulatory commissions versus NERC, um, controlling reliability, regions versus individual utilities, etc. The complication about electricity policy is that we just don't have a regulatory structure that promotes cohesive policy at a national level and electrons don't seem to abide by state borders. So if anyone Hi, wants to Steve. take that. And it's nice to hear from you. <laughs> it's uh, been a long time. And I can't believe that you sent this nasty gram question to us because um, you know, as well as all of us do, that we live in a constitutional democracy. And we, <laughs> we the, the realities that you describe there between federal and state policy are just uh, the lanes that we have to drive in in this industry um, and for better or for worse. For example, for better right now, uh, the governors and state legislators are moving out in big ways to condition the market, to make a lot of policy changes, to help uh, transform the electric grid for a lower carbon future. And so thank goodness that there's a lot of activity at the states. Um, but. But for me, one of the biggest places where there's, uh, you know, fingernails on the on the screen is with regard to transmission and the federal state um, uh, challenges associated with that. Uh, Dan and I have worked for years on this particular issue of how to provide nice little carrots out there for states to step up their uh, up their activity to see what they can do. Um, you know, I, I am at the point in my many decades of career and uh, working on transmission siting issues to think that we really may need to move to a bigger federal footprint. The, the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005 was very tepid in trying to find transmission corridors, but the design of that particular provision was um, a, a nice camel and it didn't really get us where we needed to go. So my carrot at the moment for states is think about the fact that in everywhere except Alaska, Hawaii, and Texas, you depend upon your neighboring states to deliver what you need. Uh, and uh, so step up the game in recognizing that we need a grid that is really robust and interstate. So think about the, the benefits of that regional grid as you think about siting. But if you can't get there with that, I really push for a stronger role for the feds. So the only thing I would add quickly to that brilliant answer and greetings, Steve, is um, we are, we're making progress in, in related areas. Um, the, the range of storage technologies that are now available that can help us with some of these challenges, uh, demand response. There's a whole set of things that can take these increasing amounts of variable electricity, can take lower carbon electricity, move it around. So I think there's few things to celebrate. The grid actually works pretty well day to day. 
Um, we know what the issues are facing it. You heard Jeff talk about the cybersecurity. We are making progress on storage and a whole range of technologies, batteries and well beyond. And um, so I agree with Sue. We've got to come back to Washington and we're probably going to have to, to really adopt some aggressive federal policy if we're going to really build out that, that really critical piece, which is transmission infrastructure. Um, we've tried many, many approaches. We're not doing terribly well. But meanwhile, let's build on the success we've got as well. Thank you. Um, this one is to, to Abby and Tom and actually everybody. I mean, so many of our students really want to be part of these energy transitions. And, and the question from Amanda Graham, the um, Irving Institute academic director is, how do you envision building a clean energy workforce that engages people of color? Abby, you wanna lead on that? I'll follow up. Sure. Um, I think with intentionality, <laughs> that's, that, that would be number one, right? Uh, it's not gonna happen by accident and it's not gonna happen because we wish it were so. It's gonna happen because we make decisions and invest in people and in ideas um, to bring people who aren't well represented in our industry into it. And so I think about, you know, I think about it in lots of layers. I think about it in terms of our boards, right? Like who's sitting on the boards of our companies, who's sitting on the boards of my organization, Tom can speak about his own, <laughs> but it's not particularly diverse. And so how do, we, how do we do that? I think about the workforce I have at my company um, and you know, who I'm hiring from, the relationships I'm building with HBCUs, the relationships I'm building, who, and, you know, who I'm hiring and then how I'm promoting them. I think about sort of the, what I can do for my industry in terms of best practices and giving them the tools they need um, to pull in more folks who are not historically represented in our industries. Um, so I think leadership matters. I think examples matter. I think, uh, you know, we, we've added, we talked a lot for a long time about diversity and inclusion. You know, we have, we have evolved ourselves. We've pushed ourselves to talk about justice and equity. And so, you know, it's not just getting people in the door, but it is both welcoming them and making sure that they feel comfortable there and also, um, sort of some of the systems that that are in place like board membership or like who are the experts on a panel um challenging ourselves to think a little bit differently about that so i don't have i wish i had the magic the magic potion because i'd distribute it to everybody so we could figure it out but i really do believe it happens with intentionality uh thank you abby uh great points the only ones i would add and this is um, I don't know if this is motivating or demotivating, but the reality to implement a lot of what Abby said, or I'm about to say, um, does have to do with things like task forces of your board members, task forces of your staff, pulling your industry together at conferences to talk about this, sharing of best practices. So it, it gets back to, if you will, the blocking and tackling of running an association, running, leading an industry, where we are trying to um, uh, inventory all the good things that our industry is already doing, understand what's our baseline of, of uh, how diverse are we as an industry and we are not as diverse as we need to be, how, uh, where are they in the org chart of different organizations, what do we do to promote them more quickly, mm -hmm. Um, so understand the baseline, understand what are some good programs. One of our companies has an MOU with historically black colleges. Great. Maybe we should have that as an industry-wide MOU, not just one company. So it's taking these best practices, spreading them, building on them. Um, and it, it does take sustained leadership. A point that we've been making with our board and they're very open to it but we're just reinforcing is that um, diversity of staff diversity of leadership in your companies has proven to absolutely improve the performance of your organization or of your company over time people kind of know that but um, uh, we need to remind them of that so um, we've got a sustained effort. Uh, Abby does at SIA. I know others, and we're now bringing some of these efforts together. Abby's association and mine are, are will be pulling together um, kind of each of our groups to kind of share cross industry and, if you will, renewable industry writ large. So it's a great question. It's a, 
it, we've got to just keep plugging away at this um, and be held accountable to results. Thank you. And, Thank you very much. And just a quick add on to uh, the points that Abby and Tom made, I just also remind people that uh, there's a real good opportunity with STEM to get more people into the industry uh, starting early, you know, reach out to middle school and high schoolers and, and talk about the exciting opportunities in this in these technologies and, and just increase the uh, people interested in these technologies at an early age. Thank you very much to all of you for, for your thoughtful deliberation on that. Question from Ana Marquez Pereda. How do you compare the role of private investment into the grid versus stimulus investment? Do you think one has more potential or might be more important than the other? And what are your general thoughts? Dan, do you want to try that one and then Sue, you can follow up? Sure. Let me take it at a, a slightly more general level than I know Sue's got some thoughts. Um, I, I think it, the, the need for clean energy related investment is, is huge. It's over $2 trillion a year um, in, as estimated by the International Energy Agency. If we're gonna stay within two degrees centigrade, um, we're not doing more than about 750 billion with a B. So we have a huge way to go just to get the kind of money we need into our clean energy system globally. The, the one clear thing is that a, a large proportion of those dollars are not gonna come from governments. They're gonna to have to come from the private sector, from institutional investors, um, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, endowments. The key for government is to leverage that private sector money, whether you're leveraging it to get lots of wind and solar built, whether you're leveraging it to get transmission systems built. So there's gotta be an interplay of both. Public dollars levering vastly higher amounts of, of private dollars. And if we can do that well, and there's all sorts of ideas floating around DC right now that I think could really get that moving in a very substantial way. Thank you. Let me just add on to what Dan said, uh, which, and I agree with everything that he said. Um, in the United States, the power sector is really primarily built on private investment and primarily built on private investment supported by either um, you know, electric companies with, mon with monopolies <laughs> and franchises where their customers pay to make sure that that investment is recovered. Um, and in a couple of parts of the country, of course, we do have uh, public power. Jeff works uh, in a region where there's a, a significant amount of public power. Um, and of course, around the country, there are co-ops and munis, which are public power, but it's private investment in some sense that is uh, supporting their investment. But there have been times um, in our country, and I'm thinking of the New Deal era, when there was a major investment in economic development by building very large hydroelectric facilities, both the Tennessee Valley Authority, Pacific Northwest, um, I think Hoover Dam uh, in that era. And it was because not, electricity was seen as something that could help fuel uh, development in those regions economies and I can think of the role of government money here as stimulating this kind of investment that we need today. The, uh, the Someone asked a question about uh, you know the the whether we should prioritize the electric industry as part of stimulus investment and one of the reasons why I think it's so important is if we rely on what are constrained dollars right now, frankly, given uh, the economic crisis uh, that exists on top of Abby's trifecta. Um, we, we, there, there, are, uh, there are constraints on what private dollars can come in, private financing can come into the system. And using this uh, investment to help advance preparedness for addressing climate problems in the United States. Um, you know, the most of the decarbonization studies see that the electric sector has an outsized role to play in addressing climate change. And so using these dollars to stimulate things on a more, uh, on a more aggressive and faster scale, given that we do have multiple crises going on, the electric sector needs to be a combination of public incentives and private investment. And Elizabeth, if I can jump in yeah, and agree, please. 
with Sue and Dan and with an additional point I imagine or hope they would support and that is setting aside the percentage of public <coughs> dollars, we've got to reform the policies such that those private dollars can make a return so that they can make a profit. Right now, it's really tough, it's expensive, it's a very high risk proposition trying to build transmission, especially long haul transmission, because high risk, not necessarily high return, or at least obviously so. So we do need to think through the cost allocations, the incentives, we do need some improved policies so that the private sector is motivated to get in the transmission uh, field. This is a question that actually knits you together nicely, um, posed by Michael Wood. Jeff, I'm going to let you start the response and let the others round robin as they see fit. How do we think critically about resiliency and quantify the benefits to make sure we're allocating capital well? And does this change significantly for household community resiliency versus the national bulk power system? It's a great question. I can popcorn it to all of you and you'll get a different perspective on it. Yeah, okay, I, I can start, but it's a, it is a great question. Uh, metrics are really important, and you, you really cannot effectively manage what you don't measure, and so you need to have good, solid, resilience metrics. Our industry is still working on those. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, sort of metrics that every boardroom and, and every uh, community would, would use in common, and, and so they're still evolving. Uh, resilience metrics are much more difficult to define than reliability metrics. With reliability metrics, you can count how many uh, minutes uh, customers are out of service and come up with different uh, uh, metrics for defining, you know, um, the duration of outages and how often they occur. And, and then you can, you can look at what investment you need to make um, to improve your, your numbers as it relates to uh, benchmarks with your peer utilities and things like that. Resilience is much more difficult because it's really a, a measure of preparedness. And you really don't know how resilient your system is until something big happens and you either recovered well or you didn't. And, uh, um, and you know, we, we see those when, when you do have a big event, but measuring that ahead of time is, is challenging. Um, but it, it does need to permeate um, individuals and communities. Are, it's just important to be able to uh, function and be, be uh, uh, able to function without uh, continuous supply of electricity. And then it's important for the providers of electricity to be able to, to uh, um, ensure that those services are available to the extent possible. So it's a great question. Thank you. It's a, it's a really interesting question, actually. And I, I you know, come at it probably mostly from the distributed solar side of the house, right? And my comments around folks wanting more control over their own home usage and feeling uh, a need to to have power there um, and certainly as storage options become more affordable people are doing that own assessment internally right so that rate of return on what what are the roi for them either individually or in their business right if your entire freezer goes out as we think about where dan lives in california um, and the wildfires and those forest outages or in Florida with the hurricanes, there is, a, there is an incremental piece that we have seen customers willing to pay. I think in the California PUC, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a, there's a proceeding around um, uh, monetizing and valuing resilience um, that we have been active in. And so uh, th those efforts are underway, um, but it is, uh, it is a critical, critical piece of the business model as you sell that solar plus storage um, product. Thank you. And Sue, do you wanna take that from the grid perspective? Because all of the resiliency story and reliability, we can think about it from the micro, but also the macro then how they fit together. Well, I, I really affiliate with the comments Jeff made about the need for metrics. Um, Jeff and I were both on that National Academies panel on resiliency, and that was one of the things that we really highlighted is that <laughs> you, you need to pay attention to this. Um, but there are some clever things that people have done to look at the value of resilience. For example, I'm thinking of Southern Company. Southern Company was able to get advanced meters put on every customer's uh, 
premises. And the reason was uh, that there were so many hurricanes that were taking out the system that they needed the visibility that was uh, enabled by having that kind of uh, technological aid. And they could, uh, they could justify the value of that kind of uh, connectivity by by looking at response times to recovering from an outage from a hurricane. So there are various things that people have done uh, in the industry to enhance resiliency and make a business case for it, but it's very hard. I'm aware of many others in many other states where because we don't have metrics for bulk power system resilience, uh, we do more at the local distribution level. It's very difficult in some cases, but, but we need to uh, have the industry continue to work on that. No, thank you. This is going to be my last question, and then I'm going to turn it all to you and ask what you would tell um, the Democratic nominee Biden that he should be doing for his energy plan and let you wrap up your closing comments. But here's the question from Gautam um, Janathan. Thank you for hosting the session. I'm an incoming student at Tuck T22. I believe consumer awareness is a great way to get politicians and those with decision-making power to take note of the urgency of the crisis at hand. How can we put the knowledge and its, and its power into consumers' hands here? Um, if I could just jump in and it's half answering her question uh, it, by saying it's impressive how much consumers are driving this clean energy transition that we're seeing now and consumers, whether it's individuals and, and their communications to their uh, provider, whether it's Southern Duke or some of the utility and consumers, when you think from a corporate industrial purchaser, so many of the consumers of wind energy are, whether it's Facebook and Google and IBM and Procter and Gamble are, are buying wind or solar energy. So consumers are driving a significant chunk of this clean energy economy. So all I'm saying is amen to that question because the consumers are driving a lot of the change. And what I think the key message back to consumers is clean energy can be as affordable, if not more affordable than fossil, depending upon the region of the country. In many parts, wind is the cheapest source of new electricity. So knowing that going clean can also mean being the least costly strategy as well. And I would add, speaking of driving, driving clean energy, uh, people are also voting with their pocketbook when it comes to their vehicles. They are increasingly driving plug-in vehicles. We are we're promoting states like California strongly promoting um, electric vehicle infrastructure that we need. Not only light duty vehicles, but there's now a big push for electrifying medium and heavy duty. Meanwhile, we're also consumers are voting with their wallets when it comes to um, heating and cooling their homes. Um, there is a shift. Some of it's driven by policy. Some of it is driven strictly by the market um, to move to electrical ways to heat homes with heat pumps, for example. So consumers are not only affecting how we generate electricity, but how we drive around, how we heat and cool our homes and a whole host of things. So I think if anything, consumers are getting stronger, getting stronger by the day. And if we put smart policy at the state and federal level behind that, underneath that, we're going to make this happen even more quickly. Thank you. Add one one quick thing, which is that uh, what I have seen also, and I know the same is true for Tom, is that companies will want to relocate. Like large companies will want to relocate to states, and will demand that state modify their energy policy so that they can become procurers of clean energy or owners of clean energy. That economic investment is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, to move clean energy policy. And it's, it's a voice that, you know, a, a one solar company can't share that message, but a new factory certainly can. The other thing is just the employees. Like, you know, we've talked about the consumers, mm -hmm. the employees of a lot of these companies are also pushing their leadership um, and want to work for the kinds of companies that invest in clean energy. And in addition to being consumers and employees, we're also citizens. And so for your last comments, you know, just as, as citizens, as thinking about this energy, just how you want to kind of wrap up in the last 30 seconds or so, leave us with your big ideas. And we'll go in the same order. So we'll start with Sue, Dan, Abby, Tom, and then Jeff. Sue, if you unmute yourself, we'll be able to hear you. 
<laughs> Isn't that amazing about mute, <laughs> unmuting? <laughs> I, I also uh, want to just thank Elizabeth and the Irving Institute and all of the people who have asked really great questions. Uh, I wish that we had had a chance to go through all of them. My one well, big I idea. We'll send them to you. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I was very moved by the uh, comments that Abby made about that trifecta of climate, COVID, and uh, racial injustice. And in my big idea, I just want to call your attention to an op-ed that was in Boston Globe yesterday. Uh, it, is, it was written by Nikayla Jefferson and Leah Stokes, and it's called Our Racist Fossil Fuel Energy System. Um, I am a, a, a white woman. I don't usually call uh, the fossil industry a racist industry, but this is an amazingly compelling argument for why we need to move the trifecta forward as part of a climate agenda and a clean energy agenda. So I uh, call your attention to that for everybody. So thanks to all for some great questions and great conversations. We could go on for another couple of hours and it would be fun. Um, I would just want to end with a thought. This is the Irving Institute for Energy and Society. And that word society is there for a reason. It's led by the town Elizabeth Wilson. And I say this because we all get caught up in the complexities of policy and technology and you know, investment and markets. And when it all comes down to this, what we're really trying to do is deliver for real people in society who are trying to live their lives in a healthy, prosperous, and equitable way. And I think we have to remember that whether we're out in the policy or business world, whether you are students who are moving in that direction or interested in this, remember that and society, because that's ultimately what this, all of this work about energy and climate is about. So thanks to all. Dan and Sue, thank you for those comments. I, I agree. And Elizabeth, thank you for your leadership and for giving me the opportunity. I feel honored to be associated with, with these folks who are so thoughtful. Um, I, I think my, my, my big vision is to keep the big vision, right? Like keeping bold and thinking, do not be confined by what we have done, by, by what we can do. Um, I think sometimes, sort of to Dan's point, we get wrapped around the axle on it's always been this way, or this is how our system works. Um, we need to we need to really have some radical transformation, and we can't do that by just being limited by what we've always done. So that's part of why I love being part of the Irving Institute because it fuels my soul to be with uh, younger people who just think differently and have really good new ideas and um, and challenge me. So that's my word. Thanks, Abby. Uh, I'll add my thanks to, to you, Elizabeth, and the Irving Institute. The thought that I would leave with, and I'll say the following, and it's not meant in a derogatory way, but political leaders are trailing indicators normally, not leading indicators. In other words, they follow, they do what they hear from their constituents. They kind of take it all in and sense, here's where people want me to go. So the point obviously being, our policy is set in a political environment, in a political context. So we can sit here and talk about resilience and grids and transmission, but the decisions ultimately, whether at the federal, state, local, RTO level, are made in political environments, political contexts. So all I'm obviously asking is for people to get involved get involved in the politics, in the democracy of this country, have your voice heard. That is the only way we will advance these important grid uh, stimulus, climate crisis, environmental justice crisis challenges is to have the voice of the American people heard. Thank you very much. And Jeff? Yeah, I just also want to uh, add my thanks. And it's been a lot of fun this afternoon. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so uh, great comments. I think what I would like to just add is, um, you know, let's let's think about this from a science and engineering based perspective, right? There's a there's this is a very very complex um, interdependent infrastructure. That there's a lot of unprecedented change happening right now. A lot of that change is is most excellent, um, but uh, let's guard against uh, you know. Um, Things that might uh, we might regret later if we if we run into uh, reliability resilience issues. Um, 
And so I think that uh, the best thing that uh, policymakers can do is in addition to to listening to their uh, constituents is really having a, uh, trusted advisors that can provide the, the science-based analysis, uh, the, the solid engineering work to make sure that the system continues to operate uh, as we expect it to. And, uh, you know, really as we look at accommodating all of these things, like the widespread electrification of transportation, which is going to lead to, you know, really unprecedented improvement in um, emissions across the country, and, and other other things that we can do as we're incorporating these uh, new sources of renewable energy, uh, integrating all this into a system that's that's going to work uh, still requires a lot of engineering, and so there's a lot of uh, technical skills that are going to be necessary. And I would really implore the the political leaders to listen to the science and engineers. Excellent, everyone. Played true to type, you guys rock and roll. Um, in terms of like future voices, could you guys, could you Stephanie put up the, the slide of upcoming events? I wanna thank everybody for a super time. We've been actually trying to um, focus on new energy voices. And so we've invited young scholars to talk about their research. So we have a, a, an event tomorrow on, um, for, with Rebecca Sias from Columbia University. She's moving to Purdue on energy storage for climate goals. There are a couple of conversations on that. Um, the alumni sparks, is uh, getting Dartmouth alumni helping helping students kind of bridge through. We have a couple of those on the electric grid, on finance going forward, and then uh, finally Caribbean clean energy transition on July 28th um, with uh, with uh, Caitlin Bunker from uh, Rocky Mountain Institute. So we're really trying to think about this issue from multiple perspectives, and I want to really again thank our panelists for a super time and wish everybody a good rest of your week. And we'll all be in touch. In the meantime. Take care of yourselves and um, talk to you soon. Bye everybody. Thanks again, Abby and Sue and Dan and Jeff and Tom. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Stephanie for making this all possible. Well done, okay. Elizabeth. Yeah. Thank you. Bye guys, take Bye. care. Thanks all. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye.